Hello and welcome to the Process Over Profit podcast. My name is Jack Fleming. It's a podcast focusing on marketing, business, and entrepreneurship. I'm here today with CEO Paul Zurich. How are you today, Paul? Great, Jack. How are you doing? I'm fantastic. I'm fantastic. So to give the the, the crowd a little bit of an insight, um, Paul is my friend's dad. So I met them way back when, when we were all uh, in Asheville, and now we're all, I guess, somewhere else now. Um, before I jump into it more, I want everyone to know that this podcast is brought to you by Entra, a new professional network built for entrepreneurs, investors, creators, and freelancers. You can easily create content, grow your network, and meet new like-minded people in live rooms and events on the app. All listeners can sign up for free and also get upgraded to Entra Pro, which gives you access to over $50,000 in deals and discounts with over 100 partners. Once you sign up, for Entra, go to entra.link backslash Jack to get your free Entra account and make sure you connect with me at Jack Does Marketing. I'll see you on it. Um, sweet. So why don't we start out by doing a little background on, um, I guess, who you are, how you became CEO. Um, let, let's start from like what you studied in college and then, I guess, job developments and then now you're CEO. Let's start there. Sure. Sure. Great. Thanks. For, and thanks for having me on, Jack. So, uh, so uh, I'm a military brat. Uh, went to uh, college and studied government, uh, of all things. Uh, graduated in a year when the economy, 1981, when the economy was really, really bad, even worse than this last great recession. Um, and so I did what a lot of people did. Uh, I went to law school uh, instead of going out and testing the job market. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and graduated from law school. And actually, while I was there, uh, I started working um, with companies and doing corporations law, mostly uh, selling securities, doing financings, initial public offerings, uh, all that kind of activity, which is a great way to learn business because you have to delve into uh, all the details of your, of your customers if you're going to going to be effective in, um, in helping them raise money um, and emerge and do things like that. I actually really enjoyed the practice of law, but uh, I, and I did it for about six and a half years, uh, but I always had this kind of, I frequently left uh, meetings thinking that the, uh, the clients, the business people were having more fun and, uh, and also thinking that I'd learned a lot from them and maybe I wouldn't be a bad business person myself. And then in, um, in uh, 91, I was approached by uh, somebody who was starting up an organization uh, that would play a, was envisioned and ultimately did play a major role in the re- revitalization of the REIT industry, uh, real estate investment trusts. Mm-hmm. It's, a, it's a publicly traded way for um, investors to invest in real estate on the same basis that wealthy individuals uh, can invest directly without an additional tax burden, uh, except that you can achieve scale and be professionally managed. So mm-hmm. uh, I spent uh, 11 and a half years with that company. We took, we uh, created uh, or revitalized several uh, real estate investment trusts, uh, some of which are still among the largest REITs in the, in the world today. Um, and then our organization was bought out by GE Capital in uh, 2003. I'm sorry, 2002. Uh, and then late in 2002, I came to Asheville and started doing uh, master plan communities and private real estate development uh, with a, a good, great company, Biltmore Farms here in Asheville. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Um, and then about five years ago, uh, I, you know, I, I did uh, in 2010, I started going back uh, serving on corporate boards. Uh, one of the companies I was on the board of was Coresight. And about five years ago, when uh, when we had a, a CEO deciding that uh, he wanted to get out of the public company space, um, I was asked by the rest of the board to be CEO. And I've been CEO for the last five years. Awesome. Awesome. That's a lot. Uh, so there's, I'm hearing law, you've been on boards, um, I'm hearing real estate, um, your CFO, now your CEO. So you definitely have a lot of um, business, business leadership under your belt. Um, how has, what have you learned from 
the development of these positions. So, like, obviously, each each is sort of slightly higher up than the other. Uh, definitely, CEO, uh, CFO to CEO is definitely a lot uh, a higher up position. What have you learned that has uh, transferred over from position to position? The, the the most common element is that you you have to look for a purpose. You have to look for where you can help people create uh, value and contribute value. Mm -hmm. um, that you know, honestly, that's why real estate is one of the most satisfying occupations and a lot of people enjoy it because unless you're, you know, a pretty bad real estate developer, um, everything you build will be put to good use by somebody, but you can also move up the value chain and make buildings and communities really ideally uh, or develop communities. Like even in the data center business, our business is built around, communities of companies that interoperate and exchange a lot of data with each other on, on these uh, massive data center campuses. But, mm -hmm. you know, the more valuable, the more you can make your real estate something that people want to use because it's more than just four walls and a roof, um, the better off you are. Now that doesn't always mean doing the most expensive thing like apartment developers, who can provide really functional, clean, you know, energy efficient apartments at an affordable level. They're creating just as much value as the people who are building Taj Mahal apartments. Mm -hmm. But you just got to figure out where to where do you create value? Even in mm -hmm. even in my CFO role, a big part of that was information technology. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, the, 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 this was the early days, the 90s, but even then, uh, that's when companies like ours started using techniques that are now referred to as cloud um, in order to make people's work easier. So, for mm -hmm. example, our organization supported 6,000 property managers um, who spent about 12 hours of their 40-hour average work week doing paperwork. Mm -hmm. Um, so we figured out how to make that task as easy as ordering a book off of amazon.com, which coincidentally had started off pretty recently then too. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and in the process, uh, we, sh we, uh, reduced the amount of time they had to spend doing paperwork to about two hours a, a week, which freed up 10 hours a week to take care of their customers, to get new customers, to make sure the facility that they were running was in good shape mm -hmm. um, to really, to really do more fun things and more valuable things with their job. So whatever, whatever your job is, look to uh, look for ways to add new value, uh, have a purpose of making, uh, you know, the user's experience better. Uh, and, and the rest seems to take care of itself. You do uh now. I say the rest team needs to take care of yourself. If you want to do that well, you do got to mind your P's and Q's. You got to be financially solvent. You got to plan financially. You have to have uh, resources and liquidity, and you need to you need to avoid wasting resources. You know, spending money on foolish or vain or ego driven activities. Mm -hmm. ha, ha, have you ever done that? <laughs> have you learned to do that? I guess I'm assuming you've learned to do that over the years to offer that as a tip. But I mean, that's just that is general knowledge as a business professional and CEO is to manage finances. But have there any have how have you learned that? So, uh, you know, honestly, it, yeah, it is. You know, we all all you guys, all the business uh, uh, students learn budgeting, they learn mm -hmm. finance, they learn financial planning and analysis. But there's a real difference between working from a recipe and actually cooking and tasting things as they go along. Mm. Um, and as good as our university professors and academics are, it's just impossible to replace the experience on the ground. Um, I would say too many, um, you know, the biggest thing I had to overcome, I was a pretty typical finance person. Well, not totally typical because I'd started off as a lawyer, but you know, I, I, I took the cost structure and where those costs were spent, which is as important as the cost structure itself. Mm -hmm. um, I kind of took it for granted, 
you know, I kind of tried to manage it at the margins and keep budget increases at certain levels. Um, and it wasn't until about 18 months into my, my uh, ten, first tenure as a public company CFO that I just felt like I was failing, that, mm-hmm. um, that there had to be uh, bigger moves to make. Mm-hmm. Um, and fortunately, I didn't have to figure it out on my own. I had a great group of colleagues with me working with me at Security Capital. Um, and we started figuring out, you know, where can we spend money and our resources in ways that get more value? And, you know, this this uh, moving moving to this uh, changing our IT platform to uh, replace paper with uh, digital work and using a cloud instead of deploying computers, uh, as many computers and servers all over the world. Those are the sort of things that they created value. And, and, and for the investment that we made, they were much more valuable. But you, you have to go in with that kind of um, willingness to make, to make changes, which did not come to me naturally because I was a lawyer. And lawyer, everyone who goes into law, I'm pretty convinced, does it because inherently they're risk averse. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's a good profession to go into if, uh, if you're like that. Um, and, yeah. and I was, I was definitely that way, man. I, you know, I, I, when I left college, I had about two nickels to rub together and that's it. Um, so you, you tend to be conservative and I had to shake myself out of conservatism. I had to, mm-hmm. I had to get to where I enjoyed waking up in the morning and wondering, you know, what big thing might, might we change today, mm. but also developing the discipline not to change for change sake and to manage change well, which is also something you can only learn by making a few mistakes as you uh, try it the first time. Yeah, I'm definitely pretty in touch with the the lawyer and the risk thing. Um, my, my dad's still doing law and I'm yep, yep. over here being an entrepreneur. So I get to chat with him a lot about that. Um, one of my questions was going to be the, just the industry shift, obviously going from CFO of uh, a more of like a commercial development group. Um, I just that's where I think Boomer Farms is, um, to now a data management. I, I, but you, you do say you, you were using the data management principles already in cloud computing principles already as a CFO. Um, did you have to learn any more things? I mean, it seems like it's a completely different industry. So um, just to give you, I mean, I've, I've really been fortunate to have a great diversity mm-hmm. of experience in my career. And every part of it, I've learned something new. I was actually first recruited to be a CEO of a private data center company in 1999. Okay. Wow. Um, okay. I didn't, I didn't take it at the time because I had, uh, I had a, a more attractive opportunity going on, mm-hmm. but, um, but so the part of the data business that I'm in is the real estate side of it, Okay. Uh, okay. but it's much more than real estate, um, you know, because it requires, a certain type of real estate that's constantly evolving in terms of what's in the buildings. What are the buildings like? How much security is around them? Um, Your cooling and power infrastructure and the way you staff and train and operate uh, your data centers is highly technical and, and and a lot of hard work requires really good people to do that. Um, and it's also the way we run the business. And again, you know, you, you pick something up, you learn something everywhere. <laughs> in uh, at Bitmore Farms, I was very fortunate to uh, work with uh, a colleague, Jack Cecil, who was um, just ahead of his time in terms of applying the principles of community building to real estate development. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, in the process, it you know what was what became very obvious were the tremendous synergies that exist in community uh, that are not as um, they don't exist as much in single property types. Uh, my former company kind of focused every every REIT we took public was partly successful because they focused on a particular type. Now they they have all evolved to try to incorporate, the community concept in terms of where they locate and and how they design properties. But that was a really valuable insight. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and remember, I was, I've been on the board of course site since 2010. Mm-hmm. So working with some really great directors, mm-hmm. it became obvious to us that there would be power in developing these uh, interconnected data center campuses 
that would uh, operate as uh, as communities of companies that that uh, you know in ways share their digital technology, use each other's digital technology, whether it's networking, cloud services, security service, cybersecurity services, and things like mm -hmm. that. Um, it's really great. Yeah, that sort of answers my questions on sort of what are like co-locations and and all this data management. I, I'm I, I as far as I guess think of it more as uh, the te technological term like API, and a lot of people have like Open API now, and so they're building their softwares so now that literally like other people can use that same similar software as well too. Right. So that's very important for us. Going back mm -hmm. to the interconnection uh, element I just talked about, um, there's probably on the campuses like ours, there's probably as much data exchanged on those campuses and there's, you know, there's just maybe 150, 200 of them in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe, maybe 10 or 15 of them in the United States. There's probably more data exchanged within those campuses than, you know, or it, it, as, as much or almost as much as is exchanged across the entire internet. Wow. Um, because this is where the super users of data, you know, exchange mm -hmm. data for efficiency. Mm -hmm. So, you know, again, we, we, we talked earlier about one of your goals is to constantly make people's lives, your customers, especially and your employees lives easier. Mm -hmm. So think about think about, you know, the old Lily Tomlin character, the phone operator, you know, it used to be <laughs> you would make these connections in these data center campuses. Literally, here's a port on the customer server. You plug fiber in there. Here's a port <laughs> on a network server. You plug mm -hmm. fiber in there or in a, in a switch and then goes to a network server. But that's that's pretty slow. Some people still prefer to do it that way if, if they know they're not going to move things around a lot because it's pretty pretty uh, secure and, and powerful. Mm -hmm. But more and more customers, we have something that's called an open cloud exchange. Um, and it, it, uh, it's based upon APIs between uh, major cloud providers and networks and enterprise customers so that enterprise customers can very easily go into our open cloud exchange um, and pick up a port with Microsoft or, or, or uh, Amazon, uh, Azure, Am AWS, Google Connect, mm -hmm. um, Oracle even, IBM SoftLayer and others and, and very quickly start exchanging data with them. Mm -hmm. um, and, they, and they can do it you know, basically in real time. Most of it's automated. It uh, doesn't require any special networking expertise um, for the customer. And if they decide they want to switch or add other players, they can do that, again, through the same uh, same digital interface. So oh, yeah, that's, that's really and, cool. And, and that's something that will continue to be developing elements of that concept of how companies connect together, probably never stop. Um, mm -hmm. So that for more and more enterprises connecting with more and more companies, uh, we can make that easier. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really cool. Every time you say cloud, I think of uh, Facebook. Apparently, when in one of their data centers, it was like hot and cold in, in there to where a, a, a cloud actually formed inside their building. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I, I can see that happening. It doesn't, that doesn't sound like great humidity management, but no, you know, but uh, I'm sure they got that corrected very quickly. Mm -hmm. but, the, but, the, but it's a good insight in that, you know, we, we use terms like cloud, but the cloud is actually um, a lot of metal. It's mm. just a lot. It's a lot of servers mm -hmm. all over the world. Yeah, we think of cloud just being like out there. You're just putting it in storage somewhere. Um, but I guess this is what like Google Drive is. This is what I guess Dropbox is that are, we're putting these files online in places, but they're actually having to go somewhere else to be actually stored there. Yeah, they're they're mm -hmm. stored they're stored in physical servers. Mm -hmm. Sweet, sweet. Um, so a lot of my audience, I I think it, probably my age. Um, but <laughs> I I have a mix of, of people. But when people are, let's say, uh, thinking about becoming an entrepreneur or you know have goals as being a CEO, um. I.e., like I would love to become a, a CEO of of a global company, uh, you know. I'm, I'm I'm working on it with my marketing company, I guess. But uh, what are some steps you can tell younger people 
I guess how to get there. I, I guess it's probably a lot of hard work, but even even the uh, title of CEO of a global company does. Do you feel like the weight of multiple people from different countries are like depending on you versus maybe the CEO of just a company within the United States, or is there a difference, or do you feel anything from that, or? So, so let me let me clarify. Our customers, yeah, yeah. our customers can go globally. Through mm -hmm. these interconnection facilities and our cloud and network partners mm -hmm. that we have on our campuses, all of our data center campuses are in the United States. Okay. Um, okay. But but I I I don't know that it. I'm sure they're they're my peers that have global platforms require more, um, you know, staffing and guidance around international risk management, political risk management, currency risk management issues, mm -hmm. and so that does make that job uh, significantly more challenging. Um, but I think regardless, if you're a public company CEO, there's a lot of visibility, a lot of scrutiny, and frankly, more importantly, many people depending on you, customers, employees, shareholders, pension funds, you know, mm -hmm. individual retirement accounts. I mean, it's just a, uh, you know, you, you feel a lot of it. But, but getting back to the, your original question, I, I, if you were to base, if I were to base my advice on my career, Mm -hmm. I would say don't set a goal to be a CFO or a CEO. Mm. Um, I never did. Um, when I joined, when I moved from law into um, business with security capital, the only promise I had was that I would be given the opportunity to become a business person and move out of law. Mm. And I would say the, the, the most important element of success is to always be self-critical as much as you can. Humans, we all have a hard time with that. Continue to learn. Um, be not only receptive, but the higher up you get, be more eager for change, to be a positive change agent. Um, and, and honestly, work with great ethics, um, build good relationships with people, which you can't do if you don't view every relationship as a long term relationship. And what do you have to invest in that relationship and that person to have a long term relationship? So it's it, you know, it's, it's a lot about the same things that everybody does uh, and just trying to be good humans anyway. The, the probably the biggest difference, though, is to be be a good learner, um, a fast learner, a discipline learner, and frankly, have the ability to triage, you know, as best as you can. And none of us probably do this better than a, you know, 60 or 70% success level, but, mm -hmm. you know, invest your time in the things that, that, that the, 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 the things you can learn that, that are going to really make a difference in your ability to do good things, do positive change. Don't just, uh, don't, you know, don't uh, just keep reading and learning for the sake of it. Have a goal of, uh, you know, you know where your business is going. You know the challenges within your business. Um, where do you want to look? Is it is it what other companies are doing? Is it new research from, you know, academics? Is it, do you want to bring in a consultant who will help you learn at a faster pace? Um, you know, you, but you just got to be, you got to be an aggressive and disciplined learner. Mm. And, and, and you, and you do have to honor and take care of the people that you work with. Mm -hmm. I've heard I mean, that a good bit is, uh, always being a student or, or even that entrepreneurs are firefighters and that we're like trying to literally put out fires all day, so, <laughs> answering calls and all. <laughs> so yeah, I've, I've, I've worked in some entrepreneur every, I think all the spaces I've been in have been pretty entrepreneurial. I've worked with some very entrepreneurial people. They've mm -hmm. challenged me and brought me along, but there's a huge difference between the types of organizations I've worked in where there were always a fair amount of resources, you know, not endless, but, um, but, you know, good resources and people to uh, apply to a lot of problems and, you know, we had good baselines of operations so we could seek incremental changes that were that were less risky to implement. 
-hmm. you know, your startup entrepreneur, your startup CEO. Um, I admire them so much because they're like, I heard it described that they're the, they're the people that jump off the building and figure out how to open the parachute before they hit the ground. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a, it's an interesting space to be in for sure. But it, even if it's like for me, having a marketing startup and being involved in a lot of other entrepreneurial things in town, it, it's good just to chat with other business professionals like yourself who have been in the business world, who are uh, CEOs of, of large companies, it, even though it's sort of structured differently, it's not considered a startup and you got to have a lot more, uh, le less risk possibly and more, more, uh, more things that you're uh, on your tool belt. Um, it's, it's still good to learn from each other. And obviously we, we hold, we, we sort of admire each other in that way too. <laughs> no, that, I, absolutely. Um, and, and, you know, I, ha I'm not, I haven't, I haven't totally avoided the uh, possibility of a catastrophic failure. At one point in my career, I was sent over to, I uh, worked in Europe for a couple of years uh, with the task of uh, taking a company, successfully taking a company public on the uh, Amsterdam Stock Exchange that would invest in U.S. REITs. Um, and, uh, you know, until that until that IPO was successfully completed, and really until we had follow up IPOs and 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 had the stock trade up um, for about uh, most of those two years, I, I did live pretty regularly with the uh, possibility of failure. Mm. It's a it's a it's a fun it's a fun thing to live with all the time. <laughs> um, but one of my questions I like to to ask people is um, making future claims, and I know some people don't like to do it. Um, but I think it's, it's, it's cool sometimes. And sometimes people can be very right about certain things that will happen in the future. And I definitely think with, with data management, even with like real estate, um, and, and cloud systems, they're continuing to develop as most technology always is, um, with, with things like even like crypto out now in that people are having all of these, uh, the blockchain technology mm -hmm. and all uh, like the exchange of money, um, people are changing equity and businesses with crypto. Now there's a lot of, uh, interesting things in the works. Do you see any, uh, do you have any claims for what you see for the, for the, uh, the data and cloud computing, uh, cloud space in the, in the next, let's say 10 years. I don't know if it's 10 years or not, but I think we're, I think we're definitely getting to the, that, uh, you know, star Trek like existence where you walk hmm. into a room and say, you know, computer, brew me a cup of coffee and the computer yeah. actually asks you, you know, which, uh, which coffee bean do you want today? <laughs> um, I think, you know, 5g, um, is going to take a while to roll out. Uh, and, uh, and right now there's, you know, there's different views looking at the future as to how many use cases will actually, um, be, you know, uh, uh, justify themselves from a cost perspective with 5g mm. um i just would not bet against um and, and 5g will enable these types of local data intensive mm -hmm. activities like voice yeah, yeah mm -hmm. well i mean it's not just the voice it's like all the infrastructure to you know to make sure your coffee bean dispenser is never empty and to order you know but yeah the, like all the watching and, behind it, yeah, and and watch all the you know watch all the devices. Uh, it's really, I mean, initially it'll start out where factories uh, that want to monitor a million uh, data points of equipment in their factories probably can't do that successfully right now with Wi-Fi because Wi-Fi just can't support that many devices. Um, but 5G will enable millions of devices in that kind of location. Uh, but then you're going to need all the data infrastructure along the line to backhaul that data to places where more interesting, valuable things can be done with it. Mm -hmm. So I, I think what you're going to see is uh, continuing um, development of products that will require uh, more immediate service with larger amounts of data for businesses and consumers. Um, mm -hmm. It's, you know, I, I know when Apple first came out with their iPhone, there were skeptics, like how many people really need a phone that does all this stuff? <laughs> you know, Black, Blackberry already gave us a phone where you could you could call your, your buddies up, do your email, 
and surf the net at the same time? Why do we need this thing that can hold all these other applications that can stream films, you know, that can, that can let you watch sports. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of skepticism. I don't, I don't think there's many people in America today who feel they truly can live their life without an, with an iPhone, without an iPhone, which in some way isn't necessarily great. Hmm. Um, but there's a lot of useful things that you can do with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know people have now Apple watches too, so they're even closer, not necessarily in your pocket. Now they're literally just on your watch, and you can you can make calls and all just by raising your wrist instead of having to dig in your pocket. It, it's it's a it's an interesting space to see develop and and see how they continue to develop it because I almost think that this is the pinnacle of the product they can make now, and that now they're just developing literally the camera behind things. That's the only thing being changed about these newer phones is the camera quality <laughs> well, um, well there's going to be a lot of changes to the infrastructure um you know the the cloud will actually more and more go into the network and all the way to the tower mm -hmm. um in in terms of companies sharing um you know bandwidth or companies working together to provide uh you know you know combined products that enable um, businesses and consumers uh, and businesses and businesses to interact in a 5G world uh, with more cost efficiency than would, than would be uh, and more agility than would be available if, uh, you know, if what's currently in the cloud didn't eventually uh, evolve in the network and tower space. Mm -hmm. I think it's also interesting to see the whole AI space. And now uh, we talked about a lot of data points um, I think that's pretty much what AI is, is they just comb through tons of data points to, I guess, suggest the, the right answer, suggest the right task for the the uh, technology to perform. Um, I guess we're going to see that happen even quicker and with even more capacity in the, in the coming years. Yeah, I mean, you, 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 will, you will see that, no doubt. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how fast, I don't know what the best use cases were, but I know some people that probably do know, and they're pretty <laughs> excited about it. Cool. Well, that's really all I have. I just I don't want to keep a ton of your time because I know you're CEO of a, a busy guy. Um, but thank you so much for talking with us and um, talking with me. Again, I started this podcast sort of as a personal thing because I was already talking with business professionals already, and I wanted to make it into content for other people. Um, so thank you for being on. If you have any calls to action, uh, I know I put your uh, website down below, um, but I, you're on LinkedIn. I'm on LinkedIn, mm -hmm. absolutely, and and uh, love to engage with with uh, people that you know I, that want really want to you know think maybe I can help them learn something. Mm -hmm. um, but don't mm -hmm. overestimate my ability to do that because I I feel like I'm still stumbling along and learning myself. So yeah, but even then you have a ton of experience in different fields and and different positions and that's what i really wanted to come through today is you know you have this law you have financial and now you have sort of management side all at once and uh it, it's really valuable for people wanting to get into uh just business in general and so and so thank you for for your insights jack very it was fun being on your show today and uh thank you for doing this sort of thing and have a great rest of your day thanks for being on